Hello, friends. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. My name is Dustin Jones, a founder of the Senior Rehab Project, and today we are going to play a very special episode in remembrance of an absolute legend in geriatrics. Davis Gardner passed away on March 3rd, 2019. Uh, you may have heard that name before. She uh, was the mentor of Dale Avers, who is a previous guest who's written you know, the book on geriatrics and is a member of SRP as well. Uh, but a good friend and mentor to Dale, Dale introduced me or told me I needed to um, to interview Davis a, a while back. I think it was a couple of years ago. And uh, we were able to line up that interview. And one of my favorite professors, Dr. Ann Harrison, was able to join me. And we released this episode, let's see, back in June of 2017 as when we released it. And I wanted to re-air this just so you all can uh, get to know Davis a little bit and just kind of hear her story. Uh, she was a big proponent of getting uh, geriatrics in healthcare education. So she influenced lots of physical therapists, uh, but also other healthcare providers. And you also get to hear from, from Dr. Ann Harrison as well. Uh, so this is a, a big loss to the, the geriatric community, especially in Lexington, Kentucky, but an amazing woman, amazing life, and I just really want to highlight her story. Uh, and before we get into the interview, I just want to read some words that Dale Avers uh, emailed me about Davis. So Dale said, Davis was truly a great one, making every step match her words and actions. She tirelessly pursued the notion of ridding health care of ageism, and I guarantee all of her students will continue to do the same. She was a fantastic educator, and I learned so much from her. The Christmas cactus she gave me so many years ago, passed on to me when she retired, will continue to remind me of how she made this world a better place. She certainly made me a better clinician and educator. Now it's from Dale Avers about Davis Gardner. So without further ado, here is my interview with Davis Gardner and Ann Harrison uh, way back in 2017. Enjoy. I have died and have gone to heaven. I am here in Lexington, Kentucky. It is late March. Keeneland is about to start. I've got a nice old glass of red wine, and I'm sitting here with two absolutely amazing people. One of them is Dr. Ann Harrison. She is associate professor at the University of Kentucky at the lovely physical therapy school there. I had her uh, about five years ago. Um, And if you all were at the CSM Old Not Week uh, session, she was sitting front and center, um, and she asked a really good question. I do recall that, but some of you all may have met her, but she is an amazing woman, has been very influential on me and many others. Dr. Ann Harrison, how are we doing? Thank you, Dustin, and thanks for inviting me to be here with uh, another person that I think you would have to say is has been amazing for even much longer than what you might think I have been, (laughs) and is definitely probably more amazing than I am, and that's Davis Gardner. I'll let you introduce her. All right, so Davis Gardner. Well, I'll I'll just, I'll mention the connection of why we're here, and then I'll let let you introduce. So we, many of the listeners, you all have listened to the Dale Avers interview. Uh, Dale Avers had a mentor, and that mentor (laughs) is Davis Gardner. So whenever (laughs) Uh, Dale was here in Lexington, Kentucky. She got to know her very well, and she said, you got to meet Davis Gardner and talk about geriatrics. So we are here off Tate's Creek Road uh, with a bottle of wine. So that's how we, that's how we got here. So, yeah, Ang, tell, us, tell us about this epic career. Mm-hmm. That- Davis Gardner uh, was on the faculty in the college of what was then called the College of Allied Health at the University of Kentucky. It's now the College of Health Sciences, the college in which I'm on faculty, and uh, Davis was in, uh, actually, the, in her last years on our faculty, she was funded by a federal grant to actually work on progressing people from a two-year to a four-year degree in the health sciences um, area. And at that time, she also was collaborating with the College of Education to move people for, who were health professionals into educational careers, because as many of you might be aware, uh, getting enough people in the health professions into education uh, has always been a challenge. I'm going to let Davis actually tell us a little bit about her career at the College of Health of Allied Health. Thank you, Ann. It's nice, nice to be invited to be in part of this one mm. podcast. Um, my my degrees. You're good. My degrees uh, from UK are uh, philosophy. As a as a baccalaureate degree and and uh, education curriculum and instruction as my master's degree, 
I had the opportunity coming on faculty in 1975 to uh, be a, an uh, assistant professor in what was then called the Center for uh, excuse me Center for Learning Resources. It was a Kellogg funded program, and uh, we had that funding in 1975, at which was about to run out. So I started writing grants for federal funding, and that continued very handily from 1975 up until probably 80, somewhere between 80 and 85. Mm. And that, that was just a wonderful experience. My, the, the purse, the purse, uh, one of the grants' purpose was to uh, bring in 24 allied health professions. Dentists were not included. <laughs> Nurses were not included, and, and PAs and, and MDs were not included. So this was strictly um, an allied health target group, and we'd bring in 24 at a time, four times a year, for uh, a week's work, and they were housed at the UK facility, Cronahan House, hmm. which at that time you could be roommating with somebody from the other side of the continent <laughs> for the for the week seminar. But anyway, that that worked very well. And then um, about 1985 or sometime between 85 and 90, I became interested in geriatrics, and I wrote another grant that would uh, attempt to increase the awareness of uh, uh, health professionals about the special kinds of considerations, not needs, but considerations they should keep in the background as they work with with us older people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Does that sum it up? Yeah, I think that's great. You know, one of the things that's occurred to me while I'm sitting here listening to you is what an amazing progression you were a part of where the allied health professions, quote unquote, went from a two-year degree to a four-year degree and then to a master's degree, and now in physical therapy to a doctoral degree, uh, all in the time that you actually have been able to observe and be a part of, and that's kind of neat. And then I also, so I was thinking about your contributions in that progression, and I was thinking, too, about your contributions to recognizing the areas that probably were going to be well represented among the patient population, but yet were underrepresented in the educational arena, in the health professions. So a couple of really innovative contributions, I think, that you made there. Well, thank you. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed working with the allied health people who came in for the weeks. It was a great ripple effect. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd have in 20, 24 people for a week, and we were housed at Carnahan House, and um, there were not individual single rooms with all the amenities, but... We just, each group just developed a sense of camaraderie and a common focus and interest. And so I just moved from general clinical instruction to emphasis on geriatrics. So your emphasis, when they'd come for a week, what kind of things did you do during that week? Well, we taught them how to teach. <laughs> you tell them what you you tell Teaching them. focus. Well, what was so it? you were focused, in those week-long endeavors, you were focused mm -hmm. on teaching well, health professions how to teach. And we had a, a great emphasis both in the, the didactic as well as the clinical. Um, so many, I'll give an example. There was a nationally known dietitian who was on the faculty of a renowned Eastern University who was there, and... Uh, she she said, she was talking to another dietitian from the other part of the country, and she says, why in your program do you teach thus and so? And she responded that, well, I teach thus and so because you all test for it on the boards. <laughs> and so we tried to do some sorting out of, of what was what. And I think that the probably if we made any contribution at all with the ripple effect, it was in clinical education. Um, the preceptors really, I thought, needed a lot of help, mm -hmm. especially in evaluating uh, the student's progress. And so I, I developed a note in OTE 
uh, a note of the deficit, the opportunity, oh, with the opportunity to correct it, P, within a set time limit, mm. and E, for further evaluation. Mm. And you could just note, 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 note until you decided that person was not <laughs> suited for, for the particular profession. Um, I enjoyed the work thoroughly. Did you find that people transitioned over to the College of Ed? People from the Kentucky area who came to your one week then, were they uh, stimulated or inspired then to go toward an education degree? Yes, I think so. I think so. You have somebody on your faculty right now. Yeah, the reason I ask that is as I was leaving to come here, two faculty out of our 15 faculty uh, reminded me that they had you as one of their primary mentors uh, in the College of Education when they got their master's degree in education, and now they are on faculty, and they've been on faculty in physical therapy for, you know, 25 years mm -hmm. since you were a part of their world. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, at 91, it's nice to be remembered in a positive <laughs> manner. Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, I failed to do this during the intro. Could we do a cheers real quick? Oh, absolutely. All right, beautiful. So I'm, I want both of you all's input on this. Let's say I want to become an educator, whether it's in, in a formalized setting in terms of, you know, like a school, or I want to educate my, you know, coworkers with the home health uh, agency that I work for. You know, we have a weekly meeting. I could, you know, educate them on whatever, you know, topic would be pertinent to our work. Um, what would be just a couple uh, things that I would ha have to be able to do to clearly portray a message and to actually have people change uh, because of that education? Well, <clears throat> a basic rule in structure, whether it be at the classroom or at the clinic, mm -hmm. is tell them what you're going to tell them. Do it, demonstrate, have them demonstrate back, and then tell them what you told them, mm. what you intended, what the intended outcome was. And you give them the opportunity to practice that following your exemplary demonstration, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but um, it's, been, it's been very positive. Mm -hmm. It's been very rewarding in the number of people like Dale and so on and mm -hmm. that that still remember what we were talking about. You teach them, you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you demonstrate it and illustrate and let them demonstrate back, and they should be set. Mm -hmm. If they're not, you know what deficiencies to address. Yeah. yeah. I think that piece of letting them demonstrate it back in whatever capacity of, of education that you're teaching is a critical piece because it involves engaging the student. I find that on, people who are on faculty tend to be content experts, and so they have a lot of information in their heads to impart. And I know I've been guilty of this, where you just want to get out as much as you possibly can because you have so much important, so many important things to say. But if no one hears it in the room, or you uses it, or uses it, you haven't really done your job. So I think teaching faculty how to teach and engage. Is it's it's definitely something that early on in the college of in my career in the college of uh, what's now the College of Health Sciences, then the College of Allied Health, uh, there was a lot of focus on that mm -hmm. and on um, teaching people how to teach, mm -hmm. how to teach effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so I always feel like if I get three or four main points across and they can demonstrate it back to me in whatever way I have them demonstrate it back to me, I feel good. Good. You know, good. So. And in turn, they will uh, have that kind of impact on future. The ripple, the ripple effect is, is just tremendous. One thing I'll say, too, is that I think an experiential type of uh, something that they can actually experience especially in the world of geriatrics. I know Dustin's thinking we want to talk a little bit about educating in the geriatrics realm, but there is nothing like interacting with, when you are a healthcare provider, interacting with someone who represents that 
patients that you uh, are hoping to impart information about. And I'm thinking about a time, Davis, where you, with Debbie Kelly and Debbie Brown, um, not sure who else was involved, but you all did a study, or you maybe you had some funding, where you did some work simulating, well, you brought people in who were older, and then you simulated some pathologies with those people. Yes, yes. Do you remember that? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about yes. that? Uh, it was amazing to me how willing, um, I hate to say geriatric patients, but uh, older, uh, older, older adults, adults, how willing they were to help in this, in this uh, aspect. And uh, I found that most rewarding. And they were good. Mm-hmm. And so at the time, am I right in thinking that you got volunteers to come in mm-hmm. and they actually acted out things that they had had or mm-hmm. currently had, and then students evaluated them, is that correct? Yes, yes. And it was, you evaluated yeah. the outcomes with that? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, that's very time consuming. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, PT faculty were not always so willing to allow that much time to be given, regardless of the in- improved impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, I-, I respect the faculty but there are other ways to do things. <laughs> right, and I think at the time there was a um, there was a, a lack of clinical education sites for mm-hmm. older adults. And yeah. so this was one way to make that happen. And then suddenly there started being an increase in skilled nursing facilities and that kind of thing. So now we require a rotation uh, in an environment that involves working with older adults. Wonderful. Uh, I was always so proud of our PT faculty in that uh, the students had to go a day in a wheelchair or go mm. a day with... Oh, they're still doing that. Oh, yeah. Mo- so, most impactful day of PT school. Mm-hmm. Great. Hands down. Great. Well, then I was pushing for that mm-hmm. way back yonder when I was on faculty. Well, one thing that I have learned, and the research actually supports this, is that a lot of young medical professionals don't really want to work with old people when they first get into school. And the one thing that changes their mind is exposure. Mm -hmm. Once they get to know older people, Mm -hmm. suddenly that attitude changes. Mm -hmm. So in my gerontology class, I have really tried to make as much, I have to impart some information, obviously, obviously. but I tried to make, a, make it as experiential as I could without having a lot of supervision. So I had to come up with ways to do that. That's the key thing, is figuring out ethically uh, and what works to allow exposure to older adults. So we have some assignments that are really effective at getting people Good. involved with older people and then Good. with older people with dementia, because that's another population that I think certainly young people have a lot of anxiety about in terms of interacting with people with dementia. And, of course, it, it's one of the factors that you really can't control is the uh, geriatric patient with dementia. And you can try this and you can try that and you can try the other. And the health professional, can, I think, needs to continually probe and discover what uh, what best facilitates interaction? Yeah. And you know, with the uh, with the baby boomers growing in such exponential numbers, and then therefore dementia growing in exponential numbers among the baby boomers, it's really something that they're going to encounter. Mm-hmm. They're just Absolutely. they just are going to encounter it. Absolutely. And so there's a lot more out there now on what you just described. Well. Um, a faculty member at the University of Louisville uh, is a data collection man. I can't tell you his name. But he did a, a visual, I'm primarily a visual learner, and it showed the escalating numbers of older people that uh, used to just be a very small number, and the base of a pyramid was... Uh, suddenly the tip of the pyramid and the older people who had been at the tip are indeed now the base mm-hmm. and it's just a it's just a demographic reality yeah. that uh, and i think that young people uh, unless they've had 
extraordinary experiences with grandparents or great grandparents or great aunts or whatever, uh, it's hard for them to say, oh, that's not really the way it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. I always tell my students, old is the goal, mm. you know, for mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully you will be old at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like um, as the Internet has reached every corner of society and social media and videos and pictures of, I mean, it's, it almost seems like every other week something comes across my email inbox or social media feed of uh, someone in their 80s running a marathon or someone in their 70s deadlifting 200 pounds, you know, just some of these uh, these videos that break a lot of stereotypes. Do you, do you see that impacting your students, Dr. Harrison? Well, I think that it emphasizes, and I do emphasize this, the heterogeneity of the older population. Mm -hmm. That uh, if you've met one older person, you've met one older person. Mm -hmm. And Excellent. trying yeah. not to reduce them to a stereotype, um, it's, you know, the thing is, if you preach about not stereotyping, mm -hmm. students will click off. Mm. But if you find a way to expose them, and so the internet is very helpful. I use it at the beginning of every mm -hmm. class. I'll just, I'll just, while they're settling in, put videos on of people running, mm -hmm. jumping, doing interesting different things who are old. Mm -hmm. But not to, not to preach, but just to expose. expose. And I, think, I think that's the thing. There was a film while I was active called The Bag Lady. And uh, it was it was extremely meaningful to show because it I can't remember the actual plot, but the bag lady had not been a bag lady all her life, and the circ the financial circumstances and the uh, um, environment that put her in that role mm -hmm. uh, were t entirely was beyond her control, and. Uh, it's just so important to establish a personal contact. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, health professionals um, have to be very wary of this, and they can't go home every evening mm -hmm. carrying the burdens of their, their clients. Right. But they need to make contact. You need to acknowledge that there are certain proclivities and certain handicaps that exist. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that you just said something that I, I, I think is really a tension that I face when I'm teaching with students about older people, which is that medical professionals see a lot of people. And so they have to group people together in their minds to make diagnoses. And they have to group people together to know efficiently how to snag the interventions they want to provide, whether they be ER docs or whether mm -hmm. they be physical therapists. And so we require, in order to be effective and efficient, a certain amount of grouping is required for diagnoses and interventions. Mm -hmm. And yet, how you do that and still maintain your patient-centered care, it's the challenge, I think, that we as medical professionals always have to remind ourselves about. Well, in addition, uh, the uh, interaction among the health professionals is tremendously important. Mm -hmm. um, I used to use a lot of visuals in my instruction, and I had this oval, uh, uh, and I had an inner oval mm -hmm. in the outer oval. Okay. And around the outer oval, I listed the various health professionals that would be usually interacting with geriatric patients. And I had strong, dark lines between each division. <laughs> and uh, there was no, uh, even after I got the dark lines, I had to get rid of some lines on that inner oval to show that the patient was the center of it. Mm -hmm. And don't leave, the, uh, in, in, don't leave the patient out in goal setting because what you think might be an important goal is at the bottom of their list. Mm. And what you would like to them attain might be at the top of their list. <laughs> so uh, 
that kind of interaction among health professionals yeah. and that interaction between a health professional and a, a patient, uh, I put very high on my list of priorities. Mm. You know, the challenge there is that we can teach that and we can try to create environments where they can experience it. But what, what we are faced with really is they're going out into a culture that doesn't always, that doesn't frequently practice that. Right. And so it takes a long time to change the real, cult, the real professional culture, I think. Implementation of these kinds of cultural shifts is generations in the making. But I think that we have to keep trying to do that. Well, and it's sad to hear that because um, I retired when I was 66, and we have been preaching that and demonstrating it and using visuals and using films and using actual experiential uh, experiences. And here it, here it is, how many years later? Mm-hmm. And it's still at the top of list of priorities that you'd like to achieve. It yeah. is, and they've changed some of the language and... They've changed, but they haven't changed the focus. The focus has remained. Uh, There's more actually invested in interprofessional care than there used to be, patient-centered interprofessional care in terms of education. Do you think, um, or what effect do you think that uh, our legislation now affects that? Is that a fair question? Mm. Yes, and I was thinking when you said that, that... um, there are so many factors that affect the larger culture outside of the educational institution. So productivity becomes such a huge issue for PTs. As soon as they hit the, hit the ground uh, with their license, they have to think about productivity, and they're driven to do a certain amount of productivity. But I usually tell my students when they interview, ask about that. Ask about productivity and support. And I personally don't recommend people going into places where they're seeing 25 and 30 patients a day. Now, that's a controversial statement, believe it or not, but that's the place where productivity is the only driver. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there are a lot of good places out there. Don't get me wrong. For example, Dustin works in home health, and I think home health has always been and remains one of those places one of those environments of care where there's a lot of patient-centered. It just has to be. Yeah. There's not you much. Have no choice. You have no choice. <laughs> and so I love the home health environment. Yes. In addition to uh, overcoming whatever factors may preclude uh, excitement about that, that particular assignment or rotation or whatever you want to call it, is uh, the, the factor you really can't control, and that's the family. Mm. And uh, very true. Uh, the PT goes in and has thoroughly assessed, uh, evaluated the patient, and you have a reasonable plan of action. And the patient has cooperated with you in setting a goal mm-hmm. and a reasonable time period, and and how they would work on that. And when you say uh, do fifteen two sets a day, mm-hmm. that's what you expect. Well, so. The daughter comes along and says, oh, mama, you can't do that. That's mm. too hard. <laughs> and I, I think that is a factor that it plays into the health scene today. Yeah. Yeah. And it, the, the challenging part is, th- this is just from my tiny little perspective, but that is very clear in, in home health because I interact with a lot of those people. But, you know, when I was in, say, a skilled nursing facility or outpatient ortho, you have a very limited perspective of what life is like outside of your nice, clean little clinic that you have. Yeah, right. So to address those factors can be very, very challenging. Yes. Um, but that's why I do love yeah, being in the home because you know all the barriers that are going to uh, potentially you know, get in the way of, of reaching you know, your goals for the patient within the patient's goals as well. Um, I guess another factor that I would have to consider is the attitude of acceptance or rejection of being placed in a living assisted living facility yeah. Yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Now, here at the village, uh, it's the thing to do. That's, that's the expectation. Yeah. Therapy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
particular occupational therapist has a number of clients here. Mm. And bless her heart, she got my right shoulder unfrozen after years of being frozen. Mm -hmm. But um, she, she integrates herself into the environment of, of the village. Mm -hmm. And that facilitates, in turn, effective therapy. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It yeah, it does. That, I think this is a good opportunity to um, to bring up some listener questions. Okay. So some of the patrons of the show uh, sub <laughs> submitted some questions uh, to ask. And, Davis, I'm, I'm going to ask you this. This is actually from Dale Avers herself. Um, she says, what is your advice for a young PT dealing with a, quote, in quotes, much older patient? And, for example, the, their initial approach, how to push in a genuine manner, and overall things to avoid. So you can just talk to me because I, I have this, uh, this struggle a lot. You know, there's usually a 50 to 60 year gap uh, between me and my patient. So how... Um, yeah, what advice would you give me? What things should I not do? Well, to, I think this requires more than an interview, <laughs> interview solution and answer. Do you need another glass but, of wine for it? Uh, <laughs> but, I, Dale, bless you. <laughs> uh, I think one possible consideration would be the young therapist's uh, interaction and, uh, and uh, association with a grandparent. And if that has been positive, mm -hmm. you build on that. Mm -hmm. If it has been a negative experience, well, my grandma always sent me a check, but she never signed it. Mm -hmm. So if it's been a negative experience, you've got to work on an individual basis of, mm -hmm. of trying to modify yeah. that. Yeah. I think that uh, the mindset of the, of the young therapist it's very important, mm -hmm. and that's where I think the didactic and the supervised clinical ex experiences uh, play a major part. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that we have some therapists out there who really don't like geriatric patients. Well, for Pete's sake, don't put them in charge of clinical education. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> what about communication from your personal experience? You know, what about how therapists interact and communicate with older adults? Any any insights about that? Well, first, excuse me. First of all, I'd have to say it, it runs a gamut from uh, positive to, to negative. But um, your fifteen such and such twice a day mm. can be cast off as oh well she doesn't understand me and I can't do that and da 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 da. -da, -da to those who have successfully made a personal contact as an individual to an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, don't make up my mind for me as to what I can and can't do. That's such a good point. So what would be some strategies to engage in to develop the trust and the communication, get the communication in sync between a young therapist and an older person? Well, I think at the base of that has to be honesty. Mm -hmm. um, a young therapist can't try to establish rapport by using a bunch of uh, experiences that he or she has heard about. Mm -hmm. it, it has to be personal. It has to, it has to be from a, a personal experience. And... Um, I don't care what health professional it is, unless you spend some initial time up front assessing the patient in all kinds of dimensions mm. and knowing them as not just patient number 888, mm -hmm. but as an individual. I think that's so important. That, that's the way you can be most effective, I think. When uh, Gretchen comes in to work on the frozen shoulder, uh, do I view her as intruding mm -hmm. on my life and wanting to make me do something that I haven't done for years? Mm -hmm. Or do I take her as an individual and her uh, uh, expressions of, of 
interaction with me as, as person to person, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Mm. So am I answering your question? Well, you said something that I wanted to reiterate because it's something that I think that I might need to repeat in my classroom, which is be your, for the therapist to not to be honest about what they know and don't know about what the older adult is actually experiencing. Because yes. they can't really know no. the true experience. Um, but they should not hesitate to say that uh, for the therapist to say, uh, you know, I remember so-and-so spoke about a similar situation. Mm. I'd like to check with her to see uh, what, what background information or helpful hints that she could give me. Um, I, I, th I think it increases the older person's trust when it is spread among a number of health professionals. Mm. It's sort of a balance between having, being the voice of authority about knowing about shoulders, for example, and having humility about life. Mm. I mean, you can be a shoulder person and know a lot about it as a young therapist, but there's still a lot of experiences in life that you haven't had that your patient has had. So and that's true. Sort of that's a true. combination of humility and expertise at the same time. And, and perhaps those factors would emerge from the initial interview assessment. Yeah. Uh, I think you're right. I, I, I think that a young therapist might go in with a list of questions to check off, check off, did that, done that, okay, that finishes that list, let's get to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rather than getting really getting to understand yeah. the individual's needs. Yeah. I can't downplay now. Look, I've, I've had, I have a right knee replacement. I have a right hip replacement. The left knee is held together with staples and Band-Aids. And so I have had adequate experience, I think, for me, both in the clinical setting, rehab, mm -hmm. as well as the home setting. And uh, I'd worked my tail off for Gretchen. The OT who comes We're by with this. to make sure she listens to this. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. That's great. Even with her haircut, yeah. she cut off about four inches. Oh, well, she did. Not as short as mine, though. Yeah, but, it's not purple. <laughs> but she came by to tell me that she was taking the three boys, her three boys, to uh, Vision Ford while her husband made a business trip to California. Mm. And she said, David, think about me. I said, well, now your 14-year-old will help you. And your 7-year-old yeah. is a good traveler. Give him full and happy and you'll be all right. Now the seven-month-old, you better count on this 14-year-old helping you. Exactly. Now, why, so you why had why some stuff you could tell her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why would she come and tell me that? She just wanted me to know where she was yeah. and what she was doing. Awesome. Now, I would say we connected, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. Therefore, her therapy for me is enhanced. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so often, well, um, I've had blood work done. I have my blood pressure taken every mm -hmm. Tuesday. And I have to bite my tongue. Mm. Now do this for me, the health professional says. For me, for you, my eye, <laughs> you're doing it for me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so often, watch yourselves, mm. you'll say, do this for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Really good point. Uh, I think a couple of things come to mind in terms of establishing that uh, connection. I think a lot of the listeners... Um, one of the easiest things that they will be able to do is to put the computer away um, in the sense of the, the demands that we all face in documentation and yep. the productivity. Like Dr. Harrison mentioned, it is so easy to have our laptop, tablet, whatever it is up, you know, and just typing away, not even looking at the person. In front right, of it's so efficient. Mm -hmm. And where does efficiency get in the way of practicality? Mm. Dale, I don't know whether we're answering your question or not, but we're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right, well, let, let's do some other questions. So uh, Zach Stearns asked a few. So Zach, is uh, he's about to graduate from the University of Florida, and you all like this. He actually hosts uh, him and another individual, David Reed. They host a podcast called The Voice of the Patient podcast, emphasizing... Uh, you know, 
listening to the patient and, you know, teaming up with the patient to direct care. So he says, this would be a good question for both of you all to answer. Have you all noticed, or have y'all, we're in Kentucky, have y'all noticed any changes in students over the years, more or less desire for geriatrics? So, (laughs) Davis, if you could speak, you know, to your career and then, then Anne, you know, to what you're seeing now. Well, there was great resistance earlier on when I was when I was on faculty, and uh, in the whatever instructional mode I might have been in, I always worked to establish an attitude of acceptance and camaraderie with the patient. Um, I felt I was successful. I don't know what the, what the students <laughs> thought, but. Um, I got good vibes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I am seeing more interest in geriatrics, not less. Mm. Um, Having taught this now for a number of years in the PT program, I really think, well, I, I always saw changes in the class over the time that we were teaching it because they actually had to go out and interact with people in their homes and and people would come in, and actually, older people would come in and actually communicate about their experiences. But I have them write reflections on their various experiences. And I just finished reading about 64 of them oh, wow. uh, over the weekend. Uh, and I am so touched by how touched they are. Mm. And now it could be, of course, that they want me to give them a good grade on their reflection. <laughs> no. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, they, I don't think you can make this stuff up. I think there's a lot of really growing interest in geriatrics. And then I've, I'm, I'm also seeing people coming up to me and saying, I want to work in geriatrics. I, want, I think I want to do this mm. uh, in their third year in the program. And I'm, you know, men and women. And I'm always excited when that happens just because it, it means that, that they're diverse in their thought process. And I love it when I see a, a young, especially male, come in and all he wants to do is sports medicine, which is, by the way, can be kind of boring. Um, <laughs> I just want to say short arc quads and glute sets and stuff. How many ACLs do you need? But, um, ACLs do you need how many ACL patients can you treat? I'm sure I'll get some flack for that. But I love it when by the end of the program they're interested in neuro rehab or they're interested mm. in working with older adults, or even in pediatrics sometimes. So it, sh- it says to me that I think students are coming in a little more open-minded than they used to, or at least they're leaving with a broader perspective. Well, either that or they are acutely aware of the demographic changes. There's that. Yeah. I'm sure that's driving part of it. You're so right. There's multiple factors involved here. So the demographic changes are changing their... It's causing them to be more commonly exposed to older adults. They know that when they go out, uh, a lot of the jobs are in that market. Uh, the market uh, of working with older adults, well, really the outpatient market has gotten tighter mm-hmm. and more challenging for reimbursement, whereas working with older adults in Medicare, single payer, mm-hmm. has actually been a, a, a better payer, a more reliable system than the... Um, private insurance market. So yes. that does drive that. Yes, and, and uh, it's about time. It's yeah. about time, and um, you know, we could really talk about that, I believe. Uh, <laughs> we're better or we're worse. Yeah. The single-payer concept. Yeah. I think that it was in 1985 that I wrote a federal grant and was awarded that uh, involved a consortium of, of schools in health from UK as a base to U of L to Cincinnati to West Virginia and Middle Tennessee, mm. and I think that the we got it funded, we got it refunded several times. West Virginia took off and wrote their own grant, and that took care of that. So they had to go to the budget <laughs> budget fight then. But um, it seems to me that there's a much more openness. And I, I, I don't know that I have any basis for saying this because I haven't been out and about. But the contacts that I have with the health professionals, it seems to me that there's a much more openness in the faculty and in the curricula mm. than there was than there than had been in 1985. Well, 
the faculty are getting older. Yes. And, you know, all politics are local, right? Mm-hmm. So the senators and the legislators at the state and the national level, they're getting old. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly knee arthritis is actually a really interesting and well-funded mm-hmm. area, whereas 25 years ago it really wasn't. No. Arthritis has become quite the, um, the, the sexy research area, whereas 25 years ago you just couldn't hardly talk about it. Wow. But I'm, I know it's because people who are making the decisions are old and yes. older. Yes. Um, and it's a really kind of fascinating experience. And, and they've had, in, the, in their interim, they've had experiences within their own family group. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that is a rude awakening. Yeah. But, um, you know, the old joke, yes, F, Arthur and I got out of bed this morning. Yeah. Arthur being arthritis. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, a lot of patients know him. <laughs> I guess that's still a joke that goes oh, around. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Yes. okay. All right, so Michelle Sanders, she's a physical therapist. She, uh, this is kind of funny. She says, as a non-new grad slash mature slash older PT, take your pick out of any of those, how do you keep the passion and stamina to keep up with healthcare changes and patient needs? So you all have, have quite the, the epic careers, both of you. Uh, how have you kept that stamina? Well, my reaction immediately, my immediate reaction with how I put the thought is that it's patient centered. Mm. Uh, whatever changes occur legislatively or funding wise, your concern is the patient and and how those might affect might mm. be uh, how the patient might be affected of whatever uh, legislative and funding changes. Mm. If you take your eyes off the patient, what are you doing there? Mm. Yeah. I would ditto the patient centeredness, but um, But while always remaining patient-centered, you can reinvent yourself if you have humility. So Mm -hmm. you have to be... Actually, some people do very well in one setting their whole life. But I do think in our field, we have an amazing mobility. And there's so much to learn. So for me, uh, I started out in pain management Mm -hmm. and chronic pain management. Then I worked in outpatient ortho. Then I worked in neuro rehab, adult neuro rehab. And then I came to Lexington and did more outpatient Mm -hmm. ortho and acute care. And at some point decided to do my PhD in gerontology and teach on faculty. So each time that I've gone into a new area, I knew that I was going to be uncomfortable for a little while Mm -hmm. until I learned what I needed to learn. And this field has been so rewarding for my ability to grow and grow and grow in such a variety of areas. I can't even believe I've been doing it as long as I've been doing it. Mm. But it's, um, I think if you're getting bored, if you feel beat down by the system, reinvent yourself a little bit. It doesn't mean you, you aren't going to be a PT. Mm-hmm. It means reinvent yourself within our profession. Yeah. No, you broaden yourself. Um, there's nothing like having fun what, mm-hmm. when you're working. It makes the year, time and the years go by so rapidly. And you have, are, have been able to retain your initial enthusiasm and your quest for additional information for whatever area you might be. But you have to remain a vibrant, dynamic person mm-hmm. in whatever profession you have. Yeah, and I would say don't stay somewhere Mm. where you're unhappy. In our profession, we are privileged to be able to either change where we are, uh, change the environment we're in, or change ourselves to go to a new environment. We have that capacity. A lot of people aren't that lucky, Mm. but we really don't have a good excuse for staying unhappy. (laughs) I hope that God never grants me an an unhappy therapist. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. That unhappiness translates very easily. Yeah. Absolutely. To me. Good point. And I know Michelle asked that question, but I know she's done a lot to combat, uh, you know, sense of burnout. And I know she's done um, online mentorship. So mm-hmm. there's there's a handful of us. Uh, part of the patron group will do. A monthly call, you know, where we just get on like a webinar or a webcam and, and talk and talk about patient cases or research mm-hmm. or whatnot. 
And uh, it's amazing that those technologies are available now for free, um, especially for people like me. And say if I'm on an island in home health and I don't have much interaction with other clinicians, that there there are groups of people that they can bring some life uh, to that. Well, I think that demonstrates a larger point mm. that uh, that as health professionals, you are. Um, Individuals are developing more flexibility, mm. more acceptance of uh, other health professionals and, and their contribution. Yeah. And, you know, I count that real progress. Mm. Yeah. I don't think Absolutely. that was true in 1985. Yeah. I, even mm. though I was critical earlier mm. about the interprofessional being, uh, we talk the talk, I might have implied that we don't walk the walk, but I do think you got to talk the talk first. And like you were saying, we've been talking the talk since the 80s. Um, that's a long time. But I think that it's catching up. I think we see professionals interacting quite a bit more. And I know I, was, uh, I had to go to the ER with a friend not too long ago, and I was so impressed with the interaction of the professionals in the ER where we were. Mm. And I'm thinking, and it was very patient-centered, uh, and I thought, wow, there are some things happening in the medical world that are really working, I think, in terms of the patient-centered concept. That's most rewarding to hear. <laughs> and um, uh, change, the only thing constant is change, all right? That's one of my um, mantas. Is that right? That, 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 yeah. That's the right yeah. word. That's one of my mantas. <laughs> and um, we are the ones who control some of the factors, <laughs> but not all the factors, but how the health professional reacts and use, utilizes those that are available tells an awful lot about that person. Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah, you, the, that ER experience, um, my wife and I will talk about that a lot, and that's an interesting dynamic that, you know, we may be closer to that than what we realize, but, you know, they're, some of the funds that they receive are based on the, the Prescani score or that survey that your friend will probably receive. Um, so based on how, sh how her experience was, uh, there's some, some dollars tied to that. And so um, like my, my wife, when she was in residency, they had uh, some, some people in, in like the, the Hilton uh, group. So, you know, like the hotel hospitality industry, mm -hmm. they would come and talk to the physicians, they would come and talk to the departments and the nursing staff and to take some of those, you know, service principles, those principles of hospitality into the ER because they'll make more money. I mean, granted, like yeah, it's, course, it'll be better so. patient care, but uh, it's interesting how the dollar is tied to that. But I mean, it's, it's not all good because then um, a lot of times there's more pressure to do what the, the patient wants, which may, may be contraindicated to what research says in terms of emergency situations mm. and whatnot. So it's, it's well, an yeah, interesting Well, yeah, there's a dynamic. tension, but it's still, uh, there is no hard and fast. I mean, we're talking right. about clinicians making decisions every day, a mm. bunch of clinicians getting together to make decisions mm. and still trying to interact in a way that's friendly. Yeah. So there's a lot of moving parts to that, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, in the end, of course, clinical decision-making for the patient's yeah. health is what they're there for. So. Yeah. Well, and home environment makes a difference also for those who are in home health. Yeah. Uh, the rapport established with the other residents in that older person's mm -hmm. uh, environment, um, you better recruit them. You better make friends with them mm -hmm. if you want your protocol uh, actually, actually mm -hmm. accomplished. Yeah. So I want to be respectful of your all's time. We're going for 52 minutes now. Isn't that crazy? Um, <laughs> very crazy. Zach Stearns, the, the host of the Voice of the Patient podcast, he had, he had another question that I wanted. Um, and if you could speak to this. He says, what does the youngest generation of PTs have to offer the profession that excites you? Good question. Um, do you mean like what are their characteristics that excite me? Right. Some themes, characteristics that, that have you excited for the future of our profession. When I think about this current first year group and the second year group, now this could be, I can't, I've, I've thought about this because 
I love them. I think they are awesome. And the things that I love about them are, as a group, of course, Mm -hmm. we're talking 64 people, um, but what I have noticed, and again, maybe I'm just paying more attention, but they seem to be much more altruistic. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I've heard people say that this generation's much more self-centered, but... And it could be, again, I think the people that are attracted to physical therapy tend to be a special breed. But I have really been touched by the outgoing nature, their willingness to serve, um, their volunteering for things. Again, I've been so touched by their interactions with older people and how they reflect upon them. They're more reflective than I think in perhaps in many previous years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm optimistic from that perspective. Mm-hmm. I what I really always worry about is that they're going to get out, and the cu- the culture is going to mm-hmm. beat them down a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what if there are enough in that group, and they can um, adhere to each other? Mm-hmm. Um, and adherence takes into account individual differences and so forth. Uh, they don't have to be cohesive, but they can. Oh, anyway, that's mm-hmm. making a no. silly point. No, you're not. But you're no, so right. I, I agree with you. I, one other thing I'll say about them to Zach is that they're smart. Mm. They're really sharp, and um, that's that's really neat to see too. And yeah. that combination of events: compassionate and also mm. very bright. Yeah, Even. but diverse. We're getting a actually more diverse group too. So. We're getting people from different religious faiths. We're getting people uh, of color, more people of color in our program. We're getting more men. um, And we're getting people who are a little bit older, um, rural and urban. So I like the diversity because I think that will carry out to being a positive thing when they get out into the world to practice. Very definitely. Very definitely. Okay, so... Two more questions. I want both of you all to answer them. So the first one is, who is someone that we should know more about in our geriatric rehab world? That, that's a, a stunning question. Yeah. Anyone We're that you admire in terms of uh, someone in research or an educator or a clinician that, that needs that people should should recognize or know more about for their work? I, I really far feel that I'm too far removed from the academic setting to, to really make a reasonable response to that. Yeah. So I'll leave it to Ann. I'm thinking I may have to take a break and think about this one. There's some more wine in your glass. <laughs> you could sip on that. Yeah. In the medical profession, uh, I would encourage uh, first-year medical students to really focus on family and community West medicine. Mm. I think that our, our family, family, uh, family care physicians have uh, much more flexibility about their attitudes and their ways of working with older people. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, us old folks now, we, we're not going to fuss around with those kids that ask frivolous questions. I don't have time for that. I'm late for my bingo game. <laughs> uh, now we just need to get uh, medical students to go into primary care and become family physicians. Yeah, we, we, we've, in the federal grants that I received from 1985 on, one of the primary objectives was to sensitize medical, current medical men and prospect the students to the geriatric population. And I would, I don't hesitate to say that, but we received much resistance from the MDs. Mm. And I hope it's not that way now. Yeah. <laughs> Man, you're, you're thinking hard about well, this. You know, I think one reason I'm having a hard time thinking of the whole package is I tend to agree with what Davis just said, which is the person that I'm usually attracted to 
as a mentor or someone I admire greatly is not always a famous person. <laughs> right, yeah, that's it's, the whole point. You know, it, they, they preferably not someone right. that most people know. I think probably the physicians and the therapists who are out there working in environments of care where the patients are so in need. I think of people working in, uh, you know, areas of poverty where there's um, a reduced um, medical presence, people willing to provide care because they believe in that, in in the mission of what they're doing. Um, I just have to say, I think those are the people who are the real heroes of our professions, not the people necessarily. I mean, of course, people who are doing great research and writing, it's a wonderful thing, and I admire those people. But I think because we, if you are, if you believe in the mission of what you are doing professionally and you are willing to go out and do that somewhere where you're not going to get paid a lot of money, where it comes from your heart and your soul, um, at least in some of your profession, then those to me are our, are our heroes of our profession, mm. I think. So. Preach it. A telling question is uh, <clears throat> to ask someone, how many millionaires do you know, and are they happy? <laughs> Mm-hmm. I know the answer to that mm-hmm. from personal experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Money is not happiness. Mm-hmm. Money does not buy happiness. Your commitment to whatever does buy happiness. Absolutely. I think about, when I think about my happiest PT moments, moments as a PT, I should say, in my professional moments, it certainly has never have anything to do with money. It has to do with patients, patients I adored, or students I adored. Um, it has to do with love, I think, you know, as much as anything. Love of what you do or love of your well, and of the pride. people that you're involved and with. And pride. And pride in what you do, yeah. belief in what you do. Yeah. And look at the results that you get, and you get prouder. Mm. Or more proud, whichever is dramatically <laughs> correct. We'll, we'll take both. Yeah. Okay, last question. So, Dave, so you can go first. Let's say we are at CSM, so the combined sections meeting for uh, the Physical Therapy Association. So it's the biggest conference that our profession has. And you have every geriatric rehab clinician in the room. What would you tell them? What would you want them to know? I think that, I think that they need to establish a relationship with the patient. Mm-hmm. And that will guide for their decisions, uh, therapeutically as well as uh, uh, what their profession offers. Um, take the patient where the patient is. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better. I completely agree with that. Yeah, I love it. Dr. Ann Harrison, Davis Gardner in Lexington, Kentucky, thank you all for having a lovely glass of wine. We should thank my wife as well for getting, getting the bottle <laughs> of wine. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> and it was a very good choice. <laughs> yes. Um, so, listeners, if you all have any questions for these two amazing people, you can direct them at me, and I can pass them along uh, in, in an appropriate manner. But these are two amazing people uh, in our field that have definitely paved the way for a lot of us. Um, so, yeah, thank you both for your career and, and willingness to drink some wine with a stranger for an hour or so. I, I think the re- proper response from watching television interviews is we thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs>